slowed them down and, and probably made them uh, less effective on the battlefield. And so um, they carried small round shields with leather over a wooden frame. And they wore a helmet. Um, I'm not sure whether the helmet was practical or not, but I think it had a good psychological effect on them. Though the exact origin of these warriors may never be identified, archaeologist Krzysztof Nowitzki thinks he has found one of the flashpoints. At Castry, on the coast of Crete, Nowitzki has identified remnants of a settlement unlike the many inland refuge sites he has explored. On this relatively accessible hilltop are the remains of battlements that to Nowitzki's eye suggest an experienced battle force. The people who lived here were not the normal farmers or shepherds. It's too dangerous. I mean, a small group of farmers couldn't defend it. Uh, any invaders, any raiders would easily take this, this settlement. The topography of Castri provides several strategic advantages, providing easy access to the coast of Crete, Italy and nearby islands. We may estimate probably two or three, four boats here, maybe about 50 to 100 or even 200 men, which was enough to invade, to raid the coastal places in Crete. If Nowitzki is correct, the Sea Peoples were not the last to recognize the strategic advantages of Castri. In the 1940s, this same hillside was taken by the Germans in their own attempt to dominate the island. But whereas the German troops were driven from these hills, the Sea Peoples overran Crete and the Aegean. The extent of destruction, especially at, in, in, in Anatolia, in central Greece, doesn't suggest to me a disorganized group. It suggests a rather efficient military machine. But whether this force represents outside invaders, disgruntled local warriors, or some combination of the two, the question remains the same. What's amazing about all this is that this ragtag group of marauders and pirates managed to knock off the best of the civilizations. And uh, how, how they managed to do it is, is still the major question. The answer may lie not in the origin of the Sea Peoples, but in their methods of waging war. 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, an inexorable force changed the very landscape of the ancient world. Evidence of its power was written in the toppled ruins of Mycenaean cities and the abandoned palaces of kings. The desperation of those that survived could be seen in the precarious outposts they built atop the mountains of Crete. Mighty civilizations, from the Minoans to the Hittites, survived pestilence, famine and earthquakes, only to fall to a human enemy, a mysterious force of barbarians called the Sea Peoples. But these invaders had no chariots, no armor. How could they have taken on the armies of kings? Late in the 13th century, it finally dawned on somebody that you didn't need these expensive chariots and chariot teams in order to win a battle. If you got enough runners together, and they were cheap, and they themselves have the capacity to annihilate a chariot army. One weapon made it possible for these runners to become formidable warriors. A simple weapon that until the collapse had been used primarily for hunting. The javelin is a fairly short weapon, probably four feet, and has a small metal head. I don't think that these were lethal most of the time, but they certainly would wound whatever they hit. As the raiders swarmed the disabled chariot, the well-protected charioteer would have been suddenly vulnerable. The charioteer and the chariot archer both wore a corslet with scale armor that might have weighed between 30 and 45 pounds. So obviously they cannot run um, and they are in no position to defend themselves in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
It is at this point that a team of raiders armed with short swords and lightweight shields would have had the advantage, both in numbers and mobility. That's all you'd need to do, wound a horse and that chariot is stopped. If they could, at 40 or 50 yards, hurl their javelins and bring down a chariot horse, then they were ready to come in for close combat and hand-to-hand -hand weapons, and at that point, the chariot crew is doomed. With every success, the ranks of the invaders grew and spread across the Aegean. Only Egypt was able to withstand the onslaught, although the conflict was to leave them forever weakened. So how did the pharaoh's armies withstand an assault that extinguished such powers as the Mycenaeans, Minoans and Hittites? There was a lot of diplomatic correspondence going back and forth and a lot of uh, trade in especially gold leaving Egypt through Nubia and things like horses being brought into Egypt and various other types of commodities going back and forth. So it was a period of a lot of communication between all of these powers. They had forewarning of these people coming toward Egypt, which was a very important aspect of defense. Uh, they had moved the capital of Egypt to the northern part of the country actually to defend against these people, so they were very ready. I think there's a good chance that the Egyptians were also getting their information through diplomatic messengers and couriers from the other great civilizations as one by one they fell. I mean, there are amazing spy systems in place in the ancient world, and the Egyptians certainly had their group of messengers, spies, reporters, and so they knew what was coming before it hit them. And by this time, the Egyptians knew that contrary to their name, the Sea People's greatest strength was not on the water, but on land. The conflicts were essentially land battles, but Ramses III in 1179 had the good sense to stop these raiders, these marauders, from ever getting to land. The Egyptian records, both the pictorial and the textual, they depict a battle taking place on the water, whether it's in a river mouth or actually out in the sea, it's hard to tell, but we've got boats, we've got drowning people. There's obviously a major battle going on on the water. They were out there in their boats and they were helpless out there. Uh, the Egyptian archers who were stationed on the shore or on other boats, it was uh, duck soup. Decimated by the Pharaoh's archers, the final wave of sea peoples was dispersed. But warfare would never be the same again. In the late Bronze Age, the defense of a community rested on an elite, on the charioteers and the chariot archers. In the Iron Age, which follows this catastrophe, the importance of infantrymen is much greater, and charioteers have, have become marginal. They uh, continue to be used for flanking operations, but they are no longer the essence. The essence is an infantry. In the span of just a few years, the kings and armies of the ancient world had been felled. In their wake, a new populace rose up. What the Sea Peoples do is create a power vacuum. When the Sea Peoples knocked off the top dogs of the late Bronze Age, they create a whole new situation. It's going to be the elite that go away, that are destroyed. The underclass, the middlemen, the farmers, the peasants, the slaves, they may well survive. And then what are they going to do? In the case of the shepherds and farmers seeking refuge in the mountains of Crete, the archaeological record is clear. After the defeat and dispersal of the Sea Peoples, the hardened survivors gradually returned to the lowlands. After 1200 BC, and as soon as the times became safer, people moved down to another ridge, which is about one kilometer, one and a half kilometer from here, lower and closer to their fields. Never again would they feel the need to build settlements at such heights. But the final fate of the warriors known as the Sea Peoples may never be known. The Egyptians themselves say that 
they settled some of the remnants in either Egypt itself or in Canaan. And we know that later Egyptian texts talk about the city of Dor in Israel being a Tejekar city. We know that the Pelesa settle down in Canaan. They become the Philistines. Some believe that these survivors and the remnants of the Sea Peoples may have intermingled, something future DNA testing of the remains found in the tombs may reveal. We've probably got remnants of the very civilizations that the Sea Peoples had destroyed while en route to Egypt. So we may well have Mycenaeans among the Sea Peoples, Minoans among the Sea Peoples, Hittites or Luca among the Sea Peoples, and it may well have been one of the few opportunities left to them was to join the Sea Peoples, the very group that had undone their civilization. And so the ranks of the Sea Peoples may have swelled with the very people they had just conquered. What is undeniable is that after the fall, something entirely new emerged. We're going to get dark ages for a couple of centuries as the melting pot is remixed. But up out of this, out of the uh, ashes, rise the phoenix of the Greeks. We get new political systems and new civilizations in effect. The Greeks rise up and we get things that will eventually become democracy as we know it. With the worst of motives, these sea people had destroyed one world, but obviously they opened up opportunities for people who'd never had opportunities before. We get the Israelites and David and Solomon, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, which may not have been able to exist unless the mighty kingdoms of the late Bronze Age had been done away with. So the Sea Peoples, in effect, bring about the demise of the old and the rise of the new. The exact chain of events that brought an end to one age and gave rise to another is still being investigated. I don't think Christoph has the answer, but, but he's, he's, getting, he's getting close. He's getting close to finding the answer. What I think we've really got is, is a combination of causes. The Sea Peoples got lucky. Their timing was perfect. They take advantage of some of perhaps the natural disasters if a drought had occurred, if a series of earthquakes had just occurred, we get what archaeologists refer to as a systems collapse, where one or two factors, which in and of themselves would not have caused the collapse of civilization, when they're put together, create a magnification effect. The Sea Peoples are able to exploit a hole in the defenses of these mighty civilizations where none had existed before. As archaeologists sift the clues to this ancient destruction that occurred so abruptly, they may find modern insights as well. I rather doubt that the Egyptians or the Hittites expected they would fall, or at least fall quite so quickly. But when you get a series of factors that might not otherwise be related, they could come together to create a force more powerful than each of them individually. So one of the lessons we might learn for today's society is that while a drought might not be important in and of itself or while a series of earthquakes might seem to have only a lasting impact, if you layer a couple of natural disasters 